Skin Game, written and performed by Rhonda Parker, narrated by Lukewarm DA, featuring Good Boy Audios, Synthetic Charm VA, Flute VA, and McDavis. The two men approached the cabin. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but they both knew that looks could be deceiving. Stay here. The older of the two said, I'll go check things out. The other man nodded and leaned against a tree. After several long minutes, his companion returned and handed him several sheets of paper. The young man took the small bundle in his hands. What's this? I think it's a letter. I found it jammed under the door of the cabin. He looked down at the pages. So many of her words. Ready to leap off the sheets of paper that held her scrawled handwriting. How did she have the time... He whispered. The young man swallowed hard, took a deep breath to prepare himself, and began to read. To whoever finds this, my name is Marcy Clayton. I'm 28 years old and I've been separated from my group for a few hours now, I think. I don't know who will read this, but I need to capture as much as I can before I forget it all. While I still have time. Let me start at the beginning. The virus that caused the current state of affairs descended on us seven years ago. It killed a lot of people at the beginning, but a lot of people recovered. Then the virus mutated, and we started hearing reports of people who died coming back to life. Except they weren't alive, just reanimated shells. Relatives reported that their loved ones weren't talking, just staring, and sometimes making strange noises. It unnerved them, but no one thought they were a threat. The families were just grateful to have their loved ones back. The peace didn't last, though. The nightmare began when a mortician was bitten while processing a new arrival. The mortician died from their injuries and became patient zero. It didn't take long for the virus to spread after that. It's funny, though. I watched zombie movies and television shows for years, even had one of those survival kits, and I don't think anyone saw this coming. Mother Nature apparently wanted to give us a challenge, well, boy, did she. The pandemic turned into a full-blown apocalypse. Here in the U.S., the government couldn't keep up with the infected, and eventually people started gathering into their own communities and governing themselves. While they still check in with us and provide us with supplies like food, medicine, and ammunition, we're mostly on our own. We used to ask the National Guardsmen if there was any news. Eventually, we stopped asking because the answer was always the same. They're still trying to find a solution. There were ten of us left in our group. Our home base was an old summer camp we'd cleared out, reinforcing the gates and walls as best as we could. The main buildings were solid enough, and the infirmary was in decent shape. We used the mess hall as a storeroom for our food and ammunition. The administration building became an emergency shelter of sorts, a place we could all hide if a group of zombies wandered through. While it was closer to the main gate, the walls were thicker and provided a small measure of soundproofing. The cabins served as residences, the smallest one I shared with Sam, my partner and the other leader of our group. Samuel Harper, a man I love more than anything in this crazy new world. His quiet strength, how he always looked for ways to help someone else, and that beautiful, crooked smile. Not to mention his warm, green-tinted hazel eyes that spoke of hidden depths within his soul. Sam stumbled into our camp one day, blood covering his arms and splashed across his face. His medium brown hair looked dark and wet, and flecks of gore were stuck in it like puffs of dirty gray cotton. He kept shaking, couldn't speak, and never even looked at us. We didn't know if he was still human or turning into a zombie. Henry, our resident father figure, kept me from shooting him on sight. But I targeted my gun right at Sam's head while Henry approached him. Sam never made a move, other than continuing to shake and ignore the world around him. 
Henry checked Sam over for any bites or scrapes, cleaning off some of the blood as he examined him. Once he was certain that Sam wasn't infected, we moved him into quarantine. He allowed himself to be led inside the small cabin. Henry covered him up with a blanket and we posted a guard outside the locked door. All the while, Sam was silent, his shaking now more of a tremor. A few days later, I was on duty when Sam started talking in his sleep. I heard him telling someone to run, to get away, and as I stepped inside the cabin, he sat bolt upright. As he looked at me, I saw that his eyes were confused and frightened, but clear. I explained to him that he wandered into our camp a few days before, alone and in bad shape. Eventually, he recovered his wits enough to talk about what happened, at least, what he could remember. Sam had been with his former group, a small, ragtag bunch that hadn't been together long. It began as a group of convenience, so to speak, but they managed to keep themselves alive. When they ran across a crowd of zombies, the first two went down quick, and Sam tried to save the third. But he wasn't fast enough, and they tore the last member of the group apart right in front of him. The feast set before the zombies gave him time to run. He'd found us a few hours later, in shock and drowning in a panic attack. That explained why he couldn't talk to us. It didn't make sense to Sam why he was spared and they weren't. He had tried his best to save them, but it wasn't enough. That became something we talked about whenever I was on guard duty. To be honest, we all had some form of survivor's guilt. A conversation seemed to help both of us cope, and maybe even process things a little. Being only a year or two apart in age helped, too. Sam never complained about the quarantine. Once we decided he wasn't a threat, we let him join the rest of the group. Almost immediately, he asked us how he could help. In time, more of his personality started shining through, and before long, it felt like he'd been with us forever. I think our mutual feelings took both of us by surprise. I'd sworn off any type of romantic relationship after the apocalypse started. Why get that close to someone you could lose at any minute? Carpe diem and all that, but I couldn't risk being vulnerable. With Sam, it was different. I couldn't help being attracted to him. All of the walls I'd spent so long building just crumbled. We found ourselves taking patrols together, talking whenever we had a spare moment, and became a strong team. We watched each other's backs and had a few close calls. We complimented each other so well. Today started like any other. The early summer sun glinted through the windows as Sam and I shared some quick morning cuddles, our regular routine. We drew strength from each other in those stolen moments. The feel of his fingers running through my hair, our whispers and his quiet breathing, it was enough to get me through the day. I pulled on a black and white raglan shirt, a pair of dark blue jeans, and gathered my auburn hair into a ponytail. While it was a regular morning patrol, I wanted some longer sleeves despite the heat. Just in case. Who do you want with you today? Sam asked as he pulled on an overshirt, rolling the sleeves up to his elbows. Alex and Claire, you and Margaret hold down the fort. You sure? We can't have both of us gone, and I'd rather have you here. Especially if the supply trucks show up today. I could go this time. I turned and gave him a look. It's my turn to go on morning patrol. I paused. Or are you trying to get me to shirk my duties? He grinned as he fixed the buckle on his watch. If I was, I'd be staying here too. We shared a laugh before he turned <laughs> serious again. It's just that it's been quiet lately. Be careful out there, okay? We will, Sam. I picked up my gun, checked the safety, and tucked it into my makeshift holster. I slipped my tactical knife into a sheath on the holster for easy access. I grabbed my brown rucksack from its designated spot, then walked over to Sam. I love you, you know, I said. I know. I love you too. I gave him a quick kiss and headed out the door. The sun was up, promising a warm day ahead as it began to chase away the morning's chill. The forest breathed with the sound of birds and the scuttle of small animals. It seemed a little quieter than usual, but nothing out of the ordinary. Alexander and Claire were two of our best trackers. We often sent them out together, as they worked like a well-oiled machine. Alex just turned 18 a few weeks ago. 
He had an unruly mop of dark blonde hair, brown eyes, and a penchant for being a smart mouth. Even so, most of the time he was so quiet you hardly knew he was there. A good trait for a tracker. But it also said a lot for what he'd been through. Claire was older than me, in her mid-thirties. She was a chatterbox when she got to know you. Not when she was on patrol, though. It was like a switch flipped and she became as silent as a wraith. Claire took her job seriously. We never sent anyone out alone, but out of all of us, Claire was more than capable to handle it. She was that good. Claire had coppery red hair and pale blue eyes that sparkled with friendliness, striking features that made her stand out in our little group. We finished the initial sweep, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. As we headed back towards the camp's front gate, the familiar snarl was our first warning. A zombie. Only one from the sound of it. I slipped the tactical knife out of its sheath and made ready for an attack. I didn't want to use the gun because it would make noise, and we didn't need to attract any extra guests. I looked over to Claire and Alexander, pointing to the sound and signaling my intent. They nodded and hung back as we approached the creature. As we got closer, I heard it. The snarls, the chewing, the tearing of whatever meat it had found. I peeked around a large oak tree and saw a zombie ripping the flesh from a deer carcass, wolfing it down in raw chunks. Its clothes were bloody, but not as torn as I would have expected. It must have been newly turned. I gripped the hilt of the knife and crept towards it, glancing between the zombie and the forest floor. The crinkle of leaves or a stray stick could give us away, and we couldn't afford to be noticed. I reached the creature and slammed the knife home, straight through the temple and into its brain. The zombie shuddered, barely making a sound as it went limp and dropped to the forest floor. The creature fell in such a way that it rolled over and we could see its ravaged face. My eyes widened, and Claire gasped softly. Connor. Wasn't that his name? He'd come by our camp two weeks ago, asking for anything we could spare. He had a baby face, but he looked like he was in his late twenties or early thirties. We offered to take him in for a few days, give him some shelter at least, but he declined. Didn't say why, but Sam got the feeling that he wanted to keep moving for some reason. We gave him some food and wished him well. Now he was lying at my feet as a zombie. I hoped he found some peace. Holy cripes. Alex whispered as he walked over to us. Is that Connor? Yeah, Claire said, staring down at the body. Poor guy. Come on, I said, eager to keep moving. He may not be the only one out here. It was then that the second zombie struck. The creature slammed into Alex, and they both hit the ground. Alex rolled away awkwardly and tried scrambling back, but the zombie was almost on top of him before anyone could react. Hungry, dead eyes glared at us from a rotted, patchwork face. Stay back, Claire, I shouted. Alex managed to get his rucksack between himself and the zombie, but it wasn't going to keep him safe for long. I ran over and wrapped my arms around the zombie's torso, pulling with all my might until I managed to get it off of Alex. It roared in that strange howl they all have, the one that makes you sick to your stomach to hear. The creature clawed at my arms, turning its attention to me and away from Alex. The zombie and I struggled for a few minutes, and I strained to keep its jaws away from my skin. Claire ran over and dispatched the creature just as I had the first one. You okay, Claire? I'm fine. It didn't touch me. I ran over to Alex, looking over his arms for any trace of a scratch, a bite, anything that could have broken the skin. Apart from his clothes being torn, everything looked fine. I don't see anything, Alex. How do you feel? I feel... okay. Nothing burns or feels sore. I mean, my hip isn't happy from landing on it, but that's about it. I helped him to his feet. I think you're okay, but we'll look you over back at camp. Come on, let's make sure there's no others roaming around. Once we were satisfied that no other zombies were in the vicinity, we headed back towards the old camp gate, a reinforced metal entrance that nature was reclaiming little by little. As we got closer to the middle of the camp, to our little social circle around the large bonfire area, I saw some military vehicles with the National Guard insignia on the sides, 
It looked like our monthly supply shipment had arrived. Take Alex and get him checked out. I'm going to go speak with the guardsman. Will do, Claire said. Then her eyes widened. Marcy? She said in a soft voice. What is it? She pointed at my arm. Four angry, jagged scratches glared up at me, just below where my sleeve ended. The brown crust glistened in patches where the blood was still wet. The torn skin was edged with the slightest hint of purplish blue. No. No, no, no. I breathed as I stared at my death sentence. In the struggle with the second zombie, I must have gotten scratched and not realized it. Marcy, what's wrong? Alex said as he turned to look at me. Then he got his first glimpse of my wounds. I was still in charge, infected or not, and I had to avoid a panic. Claire, take care of Alex. I'm going to talk to Sam. We'll figure this out. Don't say anything yet. Please. Claire's eyes were brimming with tears as she nodded. Alex stared at the ground as she led him over to the infirmary. I pulled down my sleeve as much as I could over the wound and looked for Sam. I saw him chatting with someone in a National Guard uniform and saw someone else talking to others in our group. A few more seemed to be gearing up for a patrol. It looked like they'd brought more personnel than usual this time. But why? Sam, I shouted, waving my good arm. His face lit up as he jogged over to me. Marcy, I'm glad you're back. They have- Sam, we need to talk, I said as I uncovered the wound. He went pale. He looked from my face to the wound, jaw slack and a catch in his throat as he tried to speak. When he found his voice, anger drove the words from his mouth. Damn it, Marcy. What happened out there? I started giving him the story, keeping my voice low. Are Claire and Alex okay? Yeah, they're at the infirmary. No wounds that I could see. I paused. Claire saw the scratches when we got back. I didn't even feel it. I didn't know. Sam sighed. We'll figure this out, but we have to be careful. He said as he looked over at the guardsmen. We couldn't be sure what they would do. It had been a long time since we'd seen them deal with an infected person. From the corner of my eye, I saw a figure approach us. A medium-built man in a National Guard uniform nodded to us in a cordial greeting. I slipped my left arm casually behind my back. Good morning, ma'am. Are you part of this group? Yes, Marcy Clayton. He looked at his paperwork. Yep, I see your name right here. Says you're one of the group leaders. That's correct, along with Sam Harper. Nice to meet you. I'm Sergeant Ethan Phillips. I haven't been to your settlement before. Smart move, building inside an old summer camp. We thought so, I said brightly. It's been a safe haven for us, that's for sure. I made the mistake of moving my left arm into his line of sight. Sergeant Phillips leaned around. Miss Clayton, what's that on your arm? I choked. Tell the truth or try to lie. My sleeve was black, so any bloodstains were likely camouflaged. But hiding an infection was a serious matter. I got scraped during our morning patrol. It's nothing, just haven't gone over to the infirmary yet. I hoped he wouldn't want to see it. His eyes narrowed ever so slightly. I can ask one of the medics to take a look. I'm sure they won't mind. That's okay, I'll get it checked out in a minute. Sam took up the narrative. Go ahead, Marcy. I can handle things here. Hang on. Sergeant Phillips said as he grabbed my arm and looked at it. That's a pretty deep scratch for something so minor. Looks like an animal might have made it. Or some other kind of creature. I yanked my arm back. Something like that? Get away from her, Mr. Harper. Sergeant Phillips said, drawing his weapon and glaring at me as he backed away. I lifted my hands up. Easy, I'm- I can guess what made that wound. You're infected. We can't let you stay here. I was furious, and I'm sure my eyes glinted. I haven't turned. It's a scratch. So you can put that gun down. Sam stepped in front of me, and the guardsman jerked his head towards him. Oh, I said get away from her. Sam's jaw clenched. She's the other leader of our group. She belongs here, infected or not. And she hasn't turned yet. She stays. The soldier's hand tightened on the gun. I said no. She stays. Another guardsman came running up to us, taking in the scene. 
I saw the medic insignia on his uniform. What's going on here? I showed the medic my arm. He studied my face for a moment. Phillips, stand down. She's infected, not turned. She's still a risk, sir. The medic turned kindly blue eyes towards me. Ma'am, how long ago were you injured? I tried to remember. Maybe an hour ago, I think. The medic nodded. She's not a threat right now. Stand down. Sergeant Phillips didn't move. His eyes were two pieces of cold flint staring at me. His finger flexed slightly, and I wondered how trigger-happy he was. Stand down, Phillips. That's an order. The medic's stern words seemed to reach him, and Sergeant Phillips reluctantly lowered his weapon. His eyes never changed. Sam walked over to my uninjured side. Careful, don't touch the- I won't. He whispered. I felt his arm wrap around my waist, and he pulled me to him. He kissed my temple, and I felt him rest his chin on the top of my head. Phillips, why don't you go join the patrol around the camp, huh? We made enough noise to attract some trouble. Y yes sir He spat out the words, as if he had a vile taste in his mouth. As the medic watched his fellow guardsmen walk away, he turned back to Sam and I. I'm sorry about that. Ethan is quick to judge. He's lost a lot of people to this virus. Makes him somewhat anxious. I wasn't totally without mercy. I get it. Thanks for intervening. The dark-haired medic smiled. I'm Lieutenant Davis, but you can call me Mike. Sam introduced me, and Mike nodded. As I was telling Sam earlier, we've been visiting settlements to deliver the vaccine. I was stunned. The... what? Vaccine. They finally got a candidate that works. Mike's face softened. But it only works on the healthy. Before the virus enters your bloodstream. Which meant I was still a dead woman walking. At least my people would be safe. Including my precious Sam. I asked the question of the desperate. Are you sure it only works on the healthy? They tested it on people in various stages of infection. The results weren't pretty. Sam's grip tightened around my waist. A thick silence descended for a moment. How long? I asked. That depends. Some people turn in a few hours, others make it closer to the 24-hour mark. Since this is a scratch and not a bite, you might have a little more time. I turned away from the compassionate look on the medic's face. I was sure there was an underlying sense of pity beneath it. How do we know she's... well, getting ready to turn? Sam asked in a quiet yet steady voice. I was glad. I needed someone to ask the questions I couldn't seem to express. From what we know, the virus attacks the stomach first. Not sure why, but all of the studies suggest that changes in the way the stomach feels gives the infected person some hints. He looked at me, and I knew I saw pity. Don't wait until you can't bear the pain anymore. By then, it may be too late. I nodded. The other things to watch out for are chills or tremors. And the time slip. That's subtle at first. But towards the end, it gets worse. Time slip? Sam asked. Your sense of time starts to get fuzzy. An hour may feel like ten minutes. You may look around and wonder why it's not dark outside, but in reality, it's still morning. He looked at me again. When it gets that bad, your brain is dying. Get away from anyone you care about, or take yourself out. His eyes were serious, but still compassionate. Now, let's take a look at that wound. Sam kept his arm around me as Mike began his examination. His gloved hands pushed up the fabric, and his brow furrowed. Not as deep as it looks, but deep enough. He pulled some clean gauze and a roll of bandages from the rucksack slung across his back. Shouldn't you save that? I asked. No sense in wasting perfectly good supplies on a dying woman. 
Mike gave us a slight smile. <laughs> You're still human. Right now, anyways. It's not a waste. He said that last sentence with the kind of care we rarely saw anymore. Maybe there was some hope for humanity after all of this. Too bad I wouldn't be around to find out. By the time Mike finished his work, Ethan appeared at the edge of the camp and headed for their vehicles. He never gave us a second glance, which was fine by me. Mike noticed his return and turned back to Sam and I. I'll give you as much time as I can. Thank you, I said. Don't mention it. Mike said as he stripped the gloves from his hands and dropped them into a thick plastic bag. I'll let you tell your group about the wound while I make a report. Was anyone else with you? I gave him Claire's and Alex's names and told him where they were. He made some notes. I'll go check them over. Then we'll finish up with the vaccines and watch for any reactions. He looked at Sam. Now would be a good time to discuss your group's options. Sam nodded, then turned to me. They want us to relocate. We could stay at the camp, but there won't be any other supply shipments. Will we be able to stay together? I asked him. This was our family, not just another group of survivors. Of course they will, Mike said. We have centers set up to help people get established elsewhere. There is a quarantine period, but I'll do my best to get your group processed as quickly as possible and help them stay together. He reached over and placed a hand on both of our shoulders. You have my word on that. We were waiting for you to get back to make the decision. Sam said, his eyes tinged with sadness. I swallowed a lump in my throat. I think it's better to evacuate. They won't make it long without supplies. Mike made another note. Okay, that's settled then. I'll tell my team to be on standby to help your group pack up. We thanked him. Then Sam said, We'll pull everyone together in a minute. Tell them what happened. Then you can explain what's going on with the relocation. As Mike walked away, Sam placed himself between me and the view of the others. Tears poured from my eyes. He used the sleeve of his overshirt to wipe them away. Sam, don't. You'll get... Your tears aren't going to infect me, sweetheart. It has to get into the bloodstream. Remember? His face was covered in tender sweetness, tainted by the harsh light of pain in his eyes. And I know you don't want the others to see you crying right now. I fell forward into his arms and buried my head in his chest. His arm wrapped around my waist and he held me close. His other hand cupped the back of my head, near the nape of my neck, and I felt his thumb brushing gently against my hair. Warm. Comforting. Safe. All right, I whispered as I moved my head off his chest. We need to tell them. I wiped the last of my tears away and gave Sam the best smile I could. The group would know I'd been crying the minute they saw my eyes, but at least they wouldn't see the actual waterworks. I had to be strong for them, not a broken, blubbering mess. Sam took my right hand and we walked up to the circle. A united front. Tessa Montgomery, one of the younger members of our family, waved as she saw us approach. Her honey blonde hair was plaited into a tight braid, as usual, and her green eyes and her smile lit up her face. I hoped she'd take this news as well as possible. She was stronger than she looked for a 13-year-old, but sometimes a glimmer of nervousness appeared in her eyes, a relic from her past. No wonder. Tessa was a shy, traumatized kid when we met her. She'd been alone, relying on her instincts and her ability to be sneaky to help her survive. We caught her trying to steal from our food supplies, but we could see it was from desperation and not malice. Still, we couldn't risk trusting her immediately. That kind of decision almost got us all killed once. We learned a hard lesson that day, as well as lost our surrogate father, Henry. Sam, Margaret, and I dug his grave with our own hands. But that was before we found Tessa, thank God. She'd seen enough violence and death by the time she got to us. I became a kind of mentor to Tessa, teaching her how to use the weapons we had and being more aware of her surroundings, although she taught me a good deal from her own experience. Little by little, her confidence and self-reliance grew. 
I watched her become a strong young woman over the last few years, and I was one proud big sister. I closed my eyes as my head swam a little. I knew it wasn't the idea of telling my family that I was dying. The virus was starting its work. Is everybody here? I asked. Yeah, we just finished getting our shots. They had a vaccine now. You need to get one, Marcy. I smiled. Not me, kiddo. A puzzled expression crossed her face. Then I tapped the bandage on my left arm. She looked at me in shock. Go gather everyone. Don't say anything. We all need to talk. Kessa nodded, then walked off to do as I asked. One by one, our little family gathered in the social circle. What was left of us, anyway. Edna, Henry's widow. Like her late husband, she was our surrogate parent. She was in her 60s, but still spry for her age. Bradley and his wife, Sheila, both in their 40s, and their 10-year-old son, Kip. Claire and her older sister, Theo. Alex. Margaret. Ten survivors. Nine would make it out. One more would be added to the casualty list. At least I'd be the last one they'd lose. Alex and Claire stood there with pained expressions, streaks of hastily wiped away tears on their faces. They already knew half of the story. Everyone else waited to hear what we had to say. I held up a hand, bit my lower lip, and started the hardest speech of my life. We need to share some news with everyone, and this won't be easy to hear. First of all, I'm infected. I raised my sleeve and showed them the bandaged wound. Eight pairs of eyes looked from me to each other, to Sam, and back to me. It happened while some of us were on the morning patrol. We got surprised by a zombie, and I got scratched in the scuffle. Hard enough to draw blood. A murmur went through the group. So far, there wasn't a rebellion. No one lunged towards me with a knife or pointed a gun at me. It said a lot for their trust in Sam and I. A brief dizzy spell struck and I shut my eyes. Sam's hand tightened on mine, holding me as steady as he could. Did everyone get their vaccine? Sam asked. A few nods, a few downcast eyes. Good. I know it's not instant protection, but it's a start. Will a shot help you, Marcy? Tessa asked. I smiled wistfully and shook my head. No. It only works on healthy people. I heard a sniffle, as if someone was fighting back tears or dealing with the ones that were already there. But I'm glad you're all going to be safe now. I smiled again and I felt a tear squeeze past my defenses. I let it run down my cheek and fall, untouched, to the ground. I saw Mike walking back towards the campfire, just in time to deliver more bad news. Sam, would you tell them the other news, please? I couldn't, not without starting to cry again. He took a deep breath. Now that there's a vaccine, the government is trying to consolidate the settlements, bring everyone closer to better manage resources. And because of that, there won't be any future supply shipments. Marcy and I spoke with Lieutenant Davis, and we agreed that it's best for all of us if we leave the camp. Now the murmur was louder, peppered with questions like, where are we going and what's going to happen to us? Sam held up his hand. Lieutenant Davis will explain more about what's going to happen. We'll be all right, don't worry. And we will be able to stay together. Sam looked over at Mike, and he nodded in agreement. As Mike stepped up and began to tell the family what would happen and how things would go, Sam and I stood in silence. I heard the sound of Mike's voice, but I couldn't listen. All I thought about was that we had to leave. No, that wasn't right. They had to leave. I couldn't go with them. Mike turned back to Sam and I with an expectant look. I stepped forward and said, I do have one more thing. I'd like us to spend a little time around the campfire, if you want to. Hesitant faces looked back at me. I couldn't blame them. I'd be less than thrilled to spend time around a zombie to be. You don't have to, and I understand why. I have some time left before I have to... Well, and I just... 
I just want to spend some time with our family. And then with Sam. I squeezed his hand and saw him swallow a lump in his throat. We know what to watch for so I don't turn and try to hurt you. And Lieutenant Davis says I have a few good hours left. I ignored the tears brimming in my eyes. I just want a chance to say goodbye. And in a bout of terrible timing on my body's part, the first real warning sign hit. My stomach bucked, and it felt like ants were crawling all through it, tickling the inside of it. What the hell? I gripped my stomach and took in gulps of air, waiting for it to pass. Sam looked at me, his arm back around my waist in an instant. You okay, Marcy? The pain subsided, but the feeling haunted me. Yeah. Just a weird stomach twinge, I guess. That seemed to make up the group's minds. Edna walked straight over to me and pulled up a lawn chair. Sam, she commanded in a caring, motherly voice. I'll be right back. I pulled my sleeve down, trying to hide the bandage this time. With the wound out of sight and my humanity still seemingly intact, we started the task of saying our farewells. About half of the family chose to say goodbye and walk away, not without pain crossing their faces, and some with tears in their eyes. Some shook my right hand, some didn't want to touch me. We said goodbye with a few words, a smile, and a nod. It was enough. There was no judgment. Our group had been through hell and back, and we knew that some people were worse off than we were. We all coped with this years-long nightmare in our own ways. And for some of us, this recent development was harder to bear. While Sam and Margaret talked about what came next for the group, I walked over to Alex, who had been silent since returning to camp. I got the feeling that something was weighing on his mind. Hey, Alex. He looked at me with dull eyes that betrayed his misplaced guilt. Hey, Marcy. Alex, this wasn't anyone's fault. That zombie could have come after any of us today. I know. His voice was almost a whisper. Did he truly know that? Was he going to blame himself for this? And I would do it all over again to protect you even if it meant me getting bit or dying out there. I wouldn't do anything different. He nodded, but I could tell I wasn't reaching him. Alexander, look at me. Pain was scorched across his young face. This is not your fault. Promise me you'll remember that. I'll try, Marcy. I will. He looked down at the ground and fidgeted. It's just... I could have been more careful, more aware. I usually am, but when we found Connor, I guess... Then it hit me. Connor wasn't part of our group, but he was the first person Alex had known before they turned. We were all caught off guard. That thing got the drop on all three of us. I placed a hand on his shoulder. Don't do this to yourself, Alex. Please. When Alex looked back up, I knew this day would haunt him for years to come, if not the rest of his life. I gave him a slight smile, and we fell into a tight hug. Thanks, Marcy. As we let each other go, Edna returned with a thick blanket, then wrapped it around me. You're gonna get cold later, honey, she said in her southern drawl as she gathered it over my chest. And I'm not going to need it after today. Thanks, Mom, I teased. Edna hugged me tight. You're welcome, smart Alec, and that's Grandma to you. I laughed. She picked up one of the lawn chairs and sat down nearby. Tessa hugged me, then she pulled up a chair as well. By the time it was said and done, five of us were at the circle. Sam, myself, Edna, Tessa, and Alex. The rest had retreated to other parts of the camp, either to take a moment or to start packing their things. Claire tried to stay with us, but her emotions got the best of her. We hugged each other, said goodbye, and she left without saying another word. The guardsmen moved back and forth, helping carry people's meager belongings or talking with our group. At one point, Mike called Sam over for a brief, whispered conversation. I had a feeling I knew why, but I chose to ignore it. We talked. We laughed. We shared stories and memories— 
both of those who were gone and those who were left. Apart from the pain in my stomach growing stronger, it was just another afternoon around the campfire. Do you remember when Henry found that snake down by the river and brought it back up here? Edna asked. I remember what he planned to do with it. <laughs> Alex quipped, stifling a laugh behind his hand. What happened? Tessa asked. Oh, he thought he would be cute and surprise me with it. Edna said, shaking her head and starting to smile. Lord, he was a mess. And then he tried to get Sam to scare me with it, I said, giving Sam a playful yet withering look. He started to laugh. <laughs> if you hadn't overheard the conversation, it would have worked. <laughs> Tessa laughed with us. Henry sounds like he was a wonderful person. Someone you all cared a lot about. Edna looked at her with a smile. He was. I wish you could have met him, Tessa. He would have liked you. Then her face fell and she went silent. Henry was also infected. History repeating itself. Edna met my eyes for a brief moment and then looked away. I held on as long as I could. Every so often a wave of dizziness or nausea would hit, or the ants in my stomach would get more active and I'd shut my eyes for a minute and grip Sam's hand. He would reply with a squeeze and keep the conversation going. He didn't give it any more attention than it needed, but at least he was aware of how I felt. When the temperature started to feel colder to me, and the ants were scrambling like mad in my stomach, I knew. It wasn't unbearable, but it was coming. I reached over and put my hand on Sam's arm. He looked at me, and in that moment, his eyes betrayed him. Sam, we should go. His eyes fell. He nodded. As he took my hand and helped me get up from the chair, the ants in my stomach morphed into spiders with long, spindly legs and fast movements. And pain. They brought pain with them. I dropped to my hands and my knees and heard the cry of a zombie. It took a minute to realize that the sound was coming from me. Sam was rubbing my back, staring at me intently. Marcy? I'm okay. I'm okay. Just getting closer. I looked up and saw the group staring at me in horror. Can't say I blamed them. Edna's hands covered her mouth, and Alex had his arm around her, keeping her steady. Then I saw Tessa. She was pointing her gun at me. Hands shaking slightly, but resolute. She would hit her target. Her face was a mix of terror and pain, and a tear ran down her cheek. I smiled at her. Good job, Tessa. As Sam helped me to my feet and she saw that I hadn't turned yet, Tessa lowered the gun. Exactly what you should do. We said our final goodbyes, and Sam and I headed to our cabin for the last time. As we left the view of the circle, my legs faltered. Sam swept me up into his arms without a second thought, holding me against his chest. <laughs> Been waiting to do that? I quipped, sounding weaker than I liked. Mm, just since you got back. He said with that crooked grin. I rested my head on his chest as he carried me the rest of the way to our cabin. Somehow, Sam managed to open the door with me bundled in his arms. He set me down on our bed, tossing the covers back. He started to take Edna's blanket from me, but I stopped him. I'm getting colder, baby. I saw him choke for a split second. I handed Sam my gun. He set it down on the nightstand, then placed a couple of pillows behind my back. He pulled up the covers and tucked me in as carefully as one would a child or an elderly relative. It was like caring for me was Sam's way of coping with this. I didn't say anything. I couldn't. It broke my heart. Sam turned and walked over to the dresser. He paused, gripping it for a moment before picking up my hairbrush. As he turned back, I saw the shine of wetness in his eyes. One more thing. 
he said as he took down my ponytail and carefully ran the brush through my hair. The scraping of the bristles echoed against my scalp, but it felt wonderful. He hadn't done that in a long time, and it never felt better than it did in that moment. Sam put the brush on the nightstand, then sat down next to me. He stretched his legs out on the covers, took my hand, and kissed my fingers gently. He gave me the bravest smile I'd ever seen as he held my hand up to his cheek. But it didn't quite reach his eyes. He'd never been able to hide behind those eyes. The final shreds of my resolve melted. I started to cry. I didn't want our last moments together to be like this. I'm sorry, Sam. For what, Marcy? I've been waiting for you to let your guard down, he said, placing his hand on the side of my face. I looked at the love of my life through tear-blurred eyes. I had to be strong. For them. For us. I had to. He smiled. But when it's just you and me... Sam pulled me into his arms, cupping my head in his hand again, just like he had earlier in the day. In that moment, Sam was the one thing holding my sanity in place. Who's going to take care of you when, when I'm gone? When I'm not there to do it? Sam ran his fingers through my hair, and his chest heaved in the throes of a deep breath. You know how fussy Edna gets over us, and Tessa loves you too much to let me suffer alone. He kissed my forehead. Now stop worrying, you stubborn woman. Let me hold you for a while. I snuggled against his side and leaned my head on his shoulder. We didn't need to speak. What was there left to say between us? We'd always been open and forthright with each other, and never missed an opportunity to share how we felt. There was no, I wish I'd been with you. No, it should have been me. We didn't have time for that. Now we just relished every second I could spare. Our shared tears did most of the talking. A few times my muscles seized, and I heard that sickening zombie wail escape my throat. It's okay. Each time Sam held me tighter, you, you know. kissed my temple softly, and reminded me that he was there. His presence was enough to calm the storm of rage and agony I could feel building inside of me. Rage at the fact that we didn't make it. That at the eleventh hour, I got infected. Agony at the physical and emotional pain of turning and leaving Sam and the others. At the pain my death would cause them. Especially dying like this. Outside the window, the light of day was fading. It looked like it would be a beautiful sunset. For a moment, I wondered if I'd get to see it. Then I looked up at Sam. The world outside didn't matter anymore. Yet again, my stomach was the clue to another phase of the infection. Sam, I'm starting to get hungry. At least that's what it feels like. He pulled away from me with a slow hesitance. I guess it's time, then. He said. I nodded. Sam looked at me, his face a mix of sorrow, anger, and something unreadable. He brushed a strand of hair from my face. I love you, you know. He said in a soft, warm voice with a hint of pain beneath it. I know. I love you, too. He leaned forward and kissed my forehead tenderly, his touch lingering on my cooling skin. I reached up and put my hand on the side of his face. I closed my eyes, trying to remember the feeling of his lips on mine. I felt another tear slip down my cheek. Damn it, this wasn't fair. Sam pulled away after a few moments, and I dropped my hand. You didn't think I'd leave without kissing you goodbye, did you? That crooked grin I loved so much lit up his face. Hey, snarky comments are my shtick, Sam. The grin faltered. I know, but I figured I'd better take up the mantle for both our sakes. We chuckled a bit. <laughs> he took my hand in his, and I could feel the warmth dripping from it. I swallowed hard. 
I had to resist this so we could say goodbye. I had to. Sam picked up the gun and set it in my hand. We'd talked about this moment years ago. Back then it made sense, but I don't think either of us realized how hard it would really be. Are you sure that- No. I looked into those hazel pools of warmth again, now streaked with red and glazed with fresh tears. I don't want that to be the last time you see me. Then you'll need this. Sam said as he unbuckled his watch and placed it on my wrist. I knew the story behind that watch, knew how important it was to him. When I started to protest, he stopped me. So you can tell what time it is, so the time slip doesn't confuse you. Sam pressed his forehead to mine and gripped my free hand. Our tears mingled on the bed covers, and I didn't want to let him go. But I knew I had to. Already his scent was less of him and more of meat. Food. A knock on the door rattled us both. Miss Clayton? Mr. Harper? Mike's voice. It's time to go. Yeah, I'm coming out now. Sam responded with a shout towards the door, then turned back to me. Mike and I will come back and check on you. Just in case. So that was what they'd talked about. The plan to neutralize the threat. Made sense. Nothing Sam and I and the others hadn't done before. It was an odd feeling to know I was the one they'd discussed, though. Sam pulled away and looked into my dying eyes. Goodbye, Mossy. He said in a choked whisper. Goodbye, Sam. He kissed my hand smiled weakly, and started for the door. I could see the effort it took for him to walk away. The door closed, and I heard him break after the lock clicked, <laughs> heard the raw emotion scraping its way into his voice. He'd done everything he could, and now it was his turn to shatter. And I couldn't help him. My poor <laughs> Sam. I never knew I had so many tears in my body. They poured from my eyes like a river of anguish, and my teeth began to rattle. I was alone now, but my family was safe. That was a comfort, at least. I wanted to wail, to scream, to unleash every morning part of me in the loudest noise possible. But I couldn't. I heard the National Guard vehicles roar to life, the sound slicing through my newly sensitive ears. I screamed, but the sound was more revenant than human. My stomach roiled then, and the spiders that had been crawling in it turned into sharp-footed centipedes. It was worse than that pins and needles feeling. It was agonizing. I gritted my teeth, curling into a tight ball, trying not to scream again. I understood more and more why all of the zombies were making the noises they did. It wasn't hunger. Or at least not just hunger. It was pain. They felt pain. What else did they feel? What else would I feel if I became one of them? That was... hours ago? A few minutes? I don't think I have much longer. Already my teeth are gnashing. My legs are jerking in twitchy spasms that are getting more frequent and violent. I'm so cold that the blankets aren't doing any good. I can smell every kind of meat around me. And it all smells the same. It all smells like food. And I'm so hungry. I need to decide what to do. The gun is heavy in my hand, as weighty as the decision I need to make. Will God forgive me if I pull the trigger? Will he grant me eternal rest if I don't? I have to end this missive here. I can feel what's left of my humanity falling away. I can't tell what time it is anymore. It looks like daylight, but that doesn't make sense. 
It feels like the middle of the night. According to Sam's watch, it's almost eight o'clock in the morning. If I don't use the gun soon, it will be too late. If my body isn't here when someone finds this, look for a zombie with a bloody black and white raglan shirt on. Auburn hair, about five six. Then kill her quick. Please. The young man's tears caused parts of the ink on the last page to run. He stared blankly at the forest floor for a moment, then shook his head. I should have stayed with her. I shouldn't have left her alone. His companion laid a hand on his shoulder. Marcy didn't want you to be there, Sam. I know that may not be a comfort, but I get the feeling she was pretty stubborn. Oh, you have no idea, Mike. Sam said as a smile tried to get past his defenses. Stubborn. But Marcy also loved him with a ferocity that rivaled his own affection for her. They never expected a happy ending, but that didn't mean they hadn't hoped for one. Now Marcy was gone, and Sam was left to figure out how to live without her. I'm sorry for your loss, Ethan said in a quiet, sincere voice. Sam nodded his thanks. Both of the guardsmen had returned to the camp with him to check on Marcy to make sure she was truly gone. He wondered if Ethan did so out of duty, his own trauma, or a feeling of penance. But it didn't matter. Not anymore. Sam looked over at Mike, not sure that he wanted the answer to the question he'd been asking himself since he closed the cabin door and left with the others. But he had to know. So, what's next? Are we burying her? Or do we have to kill her? <laughs>